Hello, Rims of the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize, and the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon are growing all around the world. This is episode number 345, and I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hello, all our friends and partners. Um, we're probably going to seem a little down today. We've been um, praying for a family that lost a small child in a tragedy over the this weekend, and um, we didn't get permission to say their name, but we wanted you to pray with us for this family. Um, we've been pretty useless the last couple of days just at the news of this, and, and we know how powerful your prayers are, and it takes powerful prayer to get through things like this. Yes, it does. It needs, they need the peace of God that surpasses their understanding. Well, Father, we lift this family up right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I just ask that the Holy Spirit would surround them. Yes. Father, that he would be the comforter in this hour of need. Father, that he would comfort this husband and wife and, and the, the three children that they have left, Father. Father, that yes. your grace... Your presence, this the sweetness of your spirit would comfort them. And Father, we just ask that you would release resources in their area, Father, from believers and family that would give them what they need to help them. Yes, support unit. Father. The, Father, a real support unit from a shoulder to cry on to helping them as they go through the grieving process, Father. Give them that support. Release the power yes. of your kingdom yes, Father. to bring them Lord. comfort, we ask. In Jesus' name. Um, as I was looking uh, at preparing the podcast this last week, uh, I kept hearing the phrase, prepare your hearts for Passover. And we've got a couple of weeks. I think it starts on the evening of April 15th this year. And... Uh, it's important that we prepare ourselves for this time because this is, you know, God's anointing goes in cycles. And so this is one of the greatest times of victory for the kingdom of God that that we'll see. And so there's so many things that, that people do on, you know, around Passover um, that really can make it rough. You know, a lot of people do Lent. And not realizing that that's, that's a, a dangerous thing to join 40 in 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. Right. And I know most people don't, don't understand that, but, but the occult understand it. God doesn't, uh, you know, he isn't uh, bringing great trauma to people that are, have done this, but he, is, uh, he knows well what the enemy does. Yeah. And the enemy doesn't matter what something looks like or what you call it. It matters what it originally is. Yeah, the ultimate PR guy and rebranding guy is Lucifer himself. Yeah, he he does that all the time, um, you know. And even as you um, get ready for Passover, we've said this a lot of times. But that egg that was put on the Passover Seder plate came during the captivity in Babylon. Yeah, and and then you know the whole almost everything that you get because I used to look for. Um, maybe plates or decorations for Passover, and almost all of them have uh, a Star of David on it, which is actually the Star of Rimfan. <laughs> uh, so there's lots of things that, you know, Satan's worked overtime to bring in paganism into every aspect of anybody that's trying to serve God. And so as we as we come toward this time, I think it's important to get a, a proper perspective of it I don't know if we all get it on in this podcast, but um, I wanted to talk about pleading the blood, um, what that means. And to do that, we have to go back and uh, talk about the original Passover. And I think Mike's even going to go back further than that to talk about <laughs> Cain and Abel. Well, you know, there's there's a, a lot of crazy stuff going around the, the Hebraic Roots movement, and there has been a reverse evangelism. Uh, going on trying to get people to deny Jesus. And one of the tactics they use, and, and this is this is more of a word gameplay, 
is that, you know, in the book of Hebrews where it says, you know, that uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now, you, if you would pull that up in, let's say, your Bible program and, and see to find that exact quote that way in the Old Testament, it's not there. But it's taught in every lesson. And we can go all the way back. And in fact, when you look at uh, Torah portions, one of the things that uh, the sages of Israel teach is that there are at least 70 teachings out of every Torah portion. And so when you look at the one of Cain and Abel, you know, we always get stuck on um, Abel offered a, a, an acceptable sacrifice, Cain did not. And the conflict between the brothers and Cain ended up killing Abel. And, you know, I've written on how that, you know, Cain was cursed of God and uh, said he was going to be a vagabond. So he was actually the one who created cities to oh, try to overcome the curse that God put on him, saying, well, this curse is on me, but I'll basically be the administrator of the city. And those that can farm will farm, and they'll take care of that aspect of it. And we get so caught up in that, sometimes we miss the most basic. And when you look at the 70 Torah portion or the teachings that can simply come out of Cain and Abel, one of them is around the righteous sacrifice of Abel, which teaches the principle that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin because he offered up a sacrifice before God. Now, when you read the Old Testament, we need to understand that there were a lot of things that the hearers of that time absolutely understood. You know, it's like going back to Genesis 6. We always deal with Genesis 6, and I know that our, our, our listeners are very familiar with that. And Moses didn't have to go a lot into uh, the kingdoms that were created by the Watchers and the Nephilim when he said the Bene Elohim, the sons of God, came down and mated with the sons of men and produced Nephilim that became the Raphaim, the heroes, the legends of old. Every single person in Israel understood exactly what he was talking about. That was that was universal knowledge in that time, okay? And so Moses, instead of going and elaborating on everything the Watchers had done, everything the Nephilim had done, he centered up on their effects upon humanity as a warning to us that when they show up, it darkens the minds of men to the place to where it even grieved God that he ever created men. That is the effect. But it doesn't mean that the watchers were not the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. That There's a Sethite theory that developed in, in the 6th century A.D., uh, and there's a whole story behind that, but it's it's now it's being taught in most uh, seminaries, and it actually violates the principles of going back and understanding the culture and hearing with the ears of those who originally heard the words. Well, it's the same thing with Cain and Abel. What's implied in Scripture is when Almighty God created coverings for them, he taught them the need for sacrifice. You cannot judge somebody for not doing something right if they'd never been taught. That's right. And Cain understood and offered up a, an animal because the penalty of sin is death and something had to die. Abel offered the animal. You said. Abel offered the animal. Okay. Cain offered vegetables. And actually one of the things that I teach is that he was actually the original priesthood of darkness member that what he did is he drew from the tree of the of knowledge of good and evil and said, I know better than God, and I'm going to offer up this because I don't want to have to go and trade vegetables to my brother for lamb. So in the, in the, in the very first stories, we understand the acceptable sacrifice is the shedding of blood for the remission of sins, and that is a conduit that goes all throughout the word of God. That's why Jesus became the Lamb of God. We find that on the Day of Atonement. We find that all we find that all over. Then the, whenever there are there is not a single sacrifice for sin that does not include the shedding of blood. Because in all of that, Almighty God was teaching them and setting the stage for his lamb to come. Mm-hmm. That's why we need Jesus. In fact, in, in Genesis 3, when, when, he, when Adam and Eve failed, God said, I'm going to fix this. 
I'm going to, there was a promise that we needed a savior that, that if, if God would have actually give us fully our just desserts and had not extended grace in the garden, humanity would have never, would have never extended beyond Adam and Eve. God would have killed them on the spot. But instead he said, I'll fix this. And it's going to trample the head of the one who tempted you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to crush his head. And so the, the blood of Jesus is, is paramount to our, our theology as believers. It's the thing that brings us into blood covenant with Almighty God. It's the thing that covers our sins, that washes us white as snow. It's the thing that brings the greatest victory uh, spiritually to any believer. The moment that the blood covers your sin, at that moment, guys, the prosecuting attorney in heaven, Hasatan, has nothing to clear. The moment that you get saved, all his, all his ledger of everything that he had against you has been wiped away, and now it says, paid in full. And part of the, 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 the feasts, uh, Rabbi uh, Ariel Berkowitz has a wonderful article on the internet, if you can find it, called The Sanctification Cycles of the Feasts. And they're, they're created to sanctify the believer, to draw us closer to God. And, and Mary, what Mary and I have discovered is every year, the Holy Spirit will bring up a certain aspect that we need to learn and apply to our lives. Mm -hmm. And they have great prophetic significance. And this year, what I believe when we're going to get into it, you know, in, in whenever you're preparing that whole week of, you know, the week of unleavened bread, everybody's going through their house and making sure that you don't even have a, you know, a can of Campbell's soup that may have yeast in it. All of that was a divine rehearsal. Mm -hmm. The Moadim mean revived by remembering that which was unprepared for that which is coming but it was a lesson to be taught. And that divine bread came down from heaven. His name was Jesus. He is the, he is the prototype. He is the, the, he is the example for us. In fact, the Apostle Paul said that we are literally predestined to be conformed into the image of the unleavened bread that came down from heaven. And so we can get all caught up with either going through our home, making sure that there's no leaven in our home, or we can do what Mary's talking about, of going through our hearts and our minds and making sure that Mystery Babylon has not gotten in. Guys, over, over the years, we have seen people that have gone through their houses and made sure there was no leaven there, but it was the, the leaven of Babylon was hanging out their ears, that there was strife and there was uh, pride and there yeah, was some, all these things. Some of them ended up in divorce. and Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of things that, I think sometimes people are more comfortable with ritual than they are with the actions that are taken to actually cleanse your heart. And a lot of people get upset with the way that we do the Passover because we don't go through the seven days of unleavened bread like like they would, where they they don't they just only eat unleavened bread. Um, we just don't do it. And one of the reasons is just a personal experience I had, which. Um, that's just for our family, but I was going to do it that way. I was going to prepare the meals, and I was, um, you know, you can fix the flat bread and have, like, tortillas without any leaven in it and things. And so I was getting ready to do that, and I just felt a check in my spirit. And so I stopped, and I prayed, and I said, God, what is this? And he said, don't ever do anything that takes away from what Jesus fulfilled. Yeah. And Jesus fulfilled that. I mean, there yeah. there is no other way to get rid of that sin other than asking forgiveness and having access to the blood of Jesus. You know, not everybody has access, do they, Mike? No, no that same person doesn't have access. No, and, and to realize that our bodies are a house. It's your house. That's right. It's the, the house that your spirit and your soul is living in. And Mary, if we would be diligent to clean that house, how transformative that would be in the body of Christ. Well, you know, in, in the Exodus... Mike, they dipped the, they took kiss and dipped, dipped it in the blood and put it over the doors, 
And they were instructed to do this because the death angel was getting ready Mm -hmm. to pass over, and it provided protection to that house. So when we plead the blood of Jesus, like over ourselves, over our family, uh, over situations, it's remembering what that blood purchased for us. It, it, it took us out of the hands of the enemy. In Psalm 107, too, it says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And, you know, before we're saved, we're just palms, you know, pawns in his hand. He's, he's in control of things. Well, the, we're in his kingdom. The Apostle Paul said we were slaves to sin, that we had these chains and, and he set us free. Now, we need to understand in the priesthood, the blood is one of the things that the priesthood handled. Mm-hmm. Okay, It's our right as part of the priesthood, and the blood can be used not only to sanctify. We see them, you know, the, the priests would sanctify and sprinkle blood uh, on things, but there's a spiritual warfare application since Jesus came that blood neutralizes the enemy's right to attack, to to do what he's doing because he has to have a sin basis. He has to have <coughs> he legal has, access. He has to have legal access, and that blood destroys that legal access. And so it's it's not like we're you know it's not re-sacrificing Jesus like the Catholic Church does or anything like that. It it is saying I am applying what Jesus did for me at this situation. Yes. And I'm drawing a line in the sand and saying, you do not cross that bloodline. That's right. Because I'm standing in my authority. And not only do I apply the blood, I bind you up in the name of Jesus yes. and I'll not have any of that. That's right. You know, because it, the Bible says Jesus rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. For those that are believers in Jesus are his followers, then we can stand in that victory. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, it says Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. We can we can apply the blood to to form a bloodline that that says, "Remember what Jesus did." I stand in the victory of what Jesus did, and where it says in Psalm one hundred seven, "Let the redeemed of the Lord say so." There's there's a testimony that we can give to enforce that. In Revelation twelve eleven, it says, "And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb." by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. The word of their testimony is you've been redeemed yeah. by the blood of Jesus. And there, there are several powerful applications of that, okay? Number one, the blood of Jesus, okay? That's, 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 a, that's a weapon being used against the enemy. Number two, when you look at the, the original Greek text and the word of their testimony, Mary can mean two things. It can mean to prophesy that you're prophetically speaking the defeat of the enemy. The other is to stand before the court of God and give testimony before a judge. Mm-hmm. So it's talking about standing in the, in, the, in the court of heaven where we humbly come. The Bible says we can come boldly uh, to the throne of grace in a time of need. That's, that's, that, that's that heavenly court and saying, Father, we, I need help. This is, this is what the enemy is doing. I need you to uh, dispatch angels, whatever you need to do, Father, to turn this situation around. I, I want you to behold what the destroyer is doing. Mm-hmm. And he's trying to cross the bloodline. He's trying to cross. He's, 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 uh, and, and, and Holy Spirit, show me in this hour, if there's, if there's anything that gives him a legal right, bring it to my remembrance so that I can repent of it and bring it under the blood. That's right. That's, that, 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 that is all a part of the spiritual warfare that we have. Well, and Satan's a deceiver, and he tries to trick you even to be in disobedient. Mm-hmm. And so if he can get you into disobedience, and even if you don't know, he says, I got you. Well, it, it's all a con game. He, he, he plays mind mm-hmm. games. He, uh, if, if he can convince you that you're defeated when you're standing in the victory and you give up, then you give way to him. You open the door. And God's mercy is available to us. I'm not uh, taken away from the mercy of God how thankful I am for his mercy in my life and in the life of others. But it's much easier in, the, in those situations to know beyond a shadow of a doubt you've got the doors closed. You're doing everything you can. You're asking forgiveness when you do mess up. And you're standing there declaring 
the power of Jesus' blood. It's just as powerful as it was when it ran down the cross. Yeah. You know, I was listening to a, um, a snippet of Henry Groover talking about, I guess he had been with Ron Wyatt, and Ron had been under where the cross of Jesus was, and it ran down on the altar. Mm-hmm. Where the, and, and so he was talking about he was there when there were people that were experts that were verifying all this. And they said that, that it had the chromosomes of the, the mother but didn't have of the father. And he said those, all of that reports verified. He said he was a witness, disappeared. And he said he believes that God will bring it back at the appropriate time. But, I mean, they, you know, Satan can't afford to have something like that out there. No, he can't. And which proved the supernatural birth of Jesus, that, that there was no father except for Almighty God. Right. Okay. Guys, with, with what I'm sensing and, and what, we have, what we have discovered is if, you, if you're prophetically sensitive— when you do the feast, God's preparing you for something. Mm-hmm. And there is, a, there is a window of anointing that's on the feast. And what I have, what I, I personally have done is during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I specifically try to spend more time in the Word, more time in prayer, but specifically, God, if I have resentment, if I have unforgiveness, yeah. And Mary, I have had God bring up what, you know, in, in, in counseling, they would call like bitter root judgments if you follow the, the Safford's way of, of counseling. I would have God just bring up something that I would have not have thought of, sometimes as young as five years old, that I made a bitter root judgment mm-hmm. that I had forgotten. Yeah, I mean, it's. I've had that happen uh, a lot. I, I don't know about you guys, but the older I get, the more dim. <laughs> My childhood gets and I got, you know, there's certain highlights and certain things you remember unless uh, there's a, a trigger that brings up a memory like, you know, the like if if somebody's cooking really good fried chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy, it'll it'll take me right to my grandma's house when I was a kid. OK, something like that. But you can't remember every moment and every situation of your childhood. It's it's this humanly impossible. That's packed in long time in long term storage. But the Holy Spirit can bring it up. And he says, you know, it's like he's saying, listen, I need to get you from A to G. And I want to do that this year. And there is an anointing on the Feast of Unleavened Bread that if there's anything the devil's banking on that you have not specifically remembered and repented of, that I'm going to loosen an anointing to bring it up to where you can repent, bring it under the blood. And the moment that you do that, the enemy cannot use you. And I've also find that in, in times of promotion, the Holy Spirit will do it when the God's getting ready to promote you and to maybe to give you a stronger anointing or something. There will be a time of preparation and there will be a testing. Yeah, there, there's always a testing. There's always a testing. And when you pass the test, the promotion comes. But what I have found out about God is God never, ever, ever gives us pop exams. The Holy Spirit's always working on us. That's true. To prepare us beforehand. Oh, isn't that a wonderful thought that He's, He's so patient with us and gives us time to prepare and the time to work through things. Um, in fact, well, Mary and I were talking the other day, and one of the most frustrating experiences I had when I was in the military at Fort Leonard Wood, and they said, "Lake, you're going for testing today," and I said, "What? Well, well, you'll find out when you get there." And they tested me in like twelve, fourteen areas. Only one was I ever taught. I didn't have a clue about the rest. And it was one of the most frustrating things. How can you test me on stuff that you mm-hmm. have never taught me? You know, like shooting an asthmus and all these different things and with a compass and stuff. I had, no one had ever showed me, no one had ever explained to me. And their, their thing was, well, just watch the guy before you and do what he's doing. Well, I don't know what's going on in his head and what he's thinking and the calculations, you know. And it was extremely frustrating. God does not do life to frustrate us. He and his grace and will always prepare us. And so if, if, we, if we do the feast right and, and prophetically go into it sensitive to the Holy Spirit instead of just going through rote, 
God will prepare us for the days ahead. He'll prepare us for what's coming up the rest of the year. And, yeah, that's right. And you, you move from a time of making sure that the blood is over the doorpost to the Holy Spirit, and we need to make sure that we have the fire of God burning at Shavuot, all the way over to, to Tisha, uh, Tisha Vah, uh, of, of the, the 40 days of, of, of repentance before the Day of Atonement. Which is a divine rehearsal yeah. for the for when Jesus comes back and uh, fixes all the junk that's going on. I mean, all of it is a sanctification process. That if we do it with spiritual application, it draws us closer to Jesus. That's right. Well, it draws us closer to each other. In First John one seven, it says, "But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin." You know, I think that. The more we um, go through these these preparation times and, and examine ourselves, I think that's when you really can have fellowship, you know, with other believers. I think so too, and I think that people that uh, go through the sanctification process and are drawing closer to God, you know, I've, I've met a lot of believers over the years, and uh, you know, I've, I've talked to even uh, other ministers about this that. Some of them say all the right things. They know all the right scriptures. But there's like a, a threshold that they have not passed that you don't feel a kindred spirit on the inside. I mean, they're doing everything right. <coughs> but there is a working on the inside that they, and I think that's part of that sanctification process, that they have drawn close enough to Jesus to where instead of just religious, they become spiritual. That there's, there's, there is, there is the, the the smell of Jesus on them, if you know what I mean, and you you sense this kindred spirit. In fact, for you know, like when I look at like, like Dr. Mike Spalding, Carl Gallops, and some others, it's like the moment that we begin fellowshipping, we sense that kindred spirit. Yeah, that's right. And and it is precious, and that's I, I think one of the things that uh, God is bringing up to us today, because in the future, guys. We're going to have to deal with people coming in to spy out our liberty and plants and everything else. We're going to have to be led by the Spirit of God. We've got to know in our spirit if the blood of Jesus is covering this individual or not and if they're in fellowship with Jesus and what they're saying is true. They can learn the lingo. And, Mary, there there have been people that have been in ministry, okay, pastoring churches, that were never saved. They were great pastors. They loved the people, and, and they taught the word. I remember uh, one of my students years ago, and, and he had went through the program, uh, finished up his Master of Divinity, and I hadn't heard from him in years. And he writes me a letter, and I, I guess, you know, uh, his family ended up falling apart, and uh, he had got on drugs for a little bit, and he wakes up in jail realizing while he had taught the word all those years, He had never been saved. And it was in that jail that the blood was finally applied and he was transformed. Well, you know, in Hebrews 10, 19, where it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. There's the prime example that we have access to the blood. Yes. And by the blood, we can go, because the blood cleanses us, we can go before the Father. We're used to, in the Old Testament, you know, they couldn't just go to the Father. And that's why that's why things are so different in the Old Testament. And people misunderstand it a lot of times. I think I used to because I thought there were two gods. I thought there was the God of the Old Testament and then there was Jesus, the God of the Old Testament. Uh, if you slipped up, you were in trouble and, and you got your head bopped. And, it, and Jesus, it was all love. And, and uh, I think people take that to an extreme and think they just do anything. And, and in fact, I heard one people say, Jesus was all love until he'd had to deal with bankers because <laughs> uh, he overthrew the money changers' tables. But, but obedience is part of it, too. It is. It is. And, and one of the things that you do witness all throughout the Old Testament, and it starts with Adam and Eve, was the grace of God was manifested. But there was a line that was eventually crossed. You know, when you sometimes when you're reading through the stories in the Old Testament, you don't realize that maybe a couple of hundred years have transpired between God warning and God pulling the trigger. Yeah. Because his grace was extended. And it, it's, it's all a, it's all for our example, the New Testament tells us, that 
All these stories, all these lives that God reveals, and God reveals the nitty and the gritty, he doesn't sugarcoat anything because it was our example so that we could see what happens when you're a stiff-necked people. And Mary, uh, stiff-necked people also means those that are rebellious, those that are stubborn. Mm -hmm. We dealt with it last week, that refuse to do it God's way, just like Cain. And others that are wounded and just yeah. are in pain. Yeah. And so they they won't turn. And and I, I think that's that's a stronghold that the enemy creates on purpose. What he does is he wounds them, and then he wraps it in a lie to make sure they stay in bondage. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're, I, I sense in my spirit we're coming up to such um, a power encounter by the Holy Spirit. And, and I think that God is, is moving his people to positions and, and having us look at things so we can be prepared to flow with it. Because, you know, sometimes I, I think in our generations we've not seen the power of the Holy Spirit that other generations had. Yeah. And I think that when we see it, you know, it's going to it's going to be jolting. I think it's it's on the horizon. I you know, I was talking to somebody yesterday uh, about our children and you know, when I I pray over my children and grandchildren, I plead the blood of Jesus. Because in the blood is what drives back the enemy. Yeah. It that, that is one thing I have seen in the times that I have seen um demons manifest and evil spirits manifest is you talk about the blood of Jesus and what the blood paid for when it ran down the cross. You talk about fear. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> they tremble at his name. They know the victory that he won. And they know the power of that blood. And so when we plead the blood, we are reminding ourselves and making that testimony it talks about in Revelation yeah. twelve eleven. We're making the testimony of this is what his, his blood purchased. Yes. This is the power of his blood. His blood overcame you. His, his blood forever defeated what the enemy was doing. Then he gave us his authority to the blood. Yes. To use the blood. To use the power of his name. Yes. To enforce what he, he did on the cross. And to move in the power of his spirit. That's right. Because Satan didn't just go away when Jesus died and rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. But he knew he was defeated. So his only way to get things done was to deceive, to yeah. lie, which is, which to is, steal. Which is what he always does. Right. I, I think he just had to regroup and reformulate. Mm -hmm. and, it, and this isn't just, I mean, I know by experience this isn't just words. You have to know it. You have to have faith in it. You have to have no doubt in your heart. That, and, and I am telling you, it's, it's that mountain-moving faith. When you s start addressing the blood of Jesus over anything the enemy's doing, because when you plead the blood, then any actions, any deception, anything going on, the blood will, will bring into the light, will reveal it. And then you can pray specifics, but I am telling you that the darkness cannot hide in the light of Jesus. No, they can't. And, you know, there, there are some great references out there. If, you know, some of this stuff is unfamiliar to you. There is a, uh, it's a Christian classic by Dr. Maxwell called The Power of the Blood. And uh, a lot of times you can pick it up on Kindle for maybe $2 uh, at Amazon. If not, you can pick, I mean, a lot of times I've, I've seen it just for 2 or $3 in paperback. Uh, Derek Prince. He's got uh, excellent Dr. Derek teachings. Prince had some excellent uh, teachings on that, as well as uh, I think a book by that title about the blood of Jesus, if I'm remembering I right. I don't remember the name. Uh, he's written a lot of. He wrote a lot of books over the years. I've but, just uh, heard him speaking on tapes. You can find him on YouTube. Yeah, just watch. And you know the, that one, and, and look up the references. Get it down in your heart. Mm -hmm. Lester Summerall's well, another one. Lester Summerall, absolutely. Get it. Get it down in your heart, uh, as as we're entering into this season. So that you understand why there had to be blood over the doorpost. Well, you have to understand that, that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And understand that hell trembles. Because, you know, the, the funny thing uh, uh, about this situation is the enemy orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus. Because the Bible says if they... If they would have known he was going to raise from the dead, they would have not have crucified mm -hmm. the Lord of glory. Of course of glory. not. He okay. won the victory. So 
when you plead the blood of Jesus, not only does it neutralize their power, it puts in their face the greatest tactical mistake mm-hmm. that they had ever made. Yeah, and it's there is no coming out of it. There's no yeah, there's, there's no, no coming back from this one. <laughs> no, you know it, it's one okay. Uh, I can I can try to do guerrilla warfare and stuff, but I know, I know that that one that shed his blood that's redeeming humanity, he's coming back. And when he's coming back, I will be powerless to stop him. Even though he's trying to convince those within the, the, the dark regions of the earth. I mean, there's, there's when, you, when you look at even what they're doing with CERN and stuff, the many believe they're trying to make the earth itself a weapon that can be fired mm-hmm. against him when he comes. But there is, there is nothing. No. I mean, God has already experienced that. He fills all time and space. He's already on the other side of this thing. And, and, and you know, the, that's why the, in Psalm chapter 2, the Bible says it's the kings of the earth. And we can interpret that as those meeting at Devos and Bilderbergers and the Cecil Road Roundtables and the CFR Council of Foreign Relations, and all these think tanks meet, plotting together. How are we going to rid Christianity off the planet? How are we going to stop Jesus from coming back? And they, they devise all these things. What does the Bible say that God does? God's laughing at them. Mm-hmm. You, th- you, th- you think there's any way, you know, you think you can do anything? Okay, I want you to, to speak and create a marble out of nothing. Well, they're trying to, like, work up power, too, because, yeah. I mean, Satan just keeps coming up with more and more things, and more horrible things, thinking that that, that evil is going to grow to the place, and so many people following him, that it's going to overcome the goodness, the righteousness. Well, and look, and look at how bad it was in the antediluvian era. One of the things that uh, Dr. Chuck Missler did is you go back and all the names that are, like, listed of those people, you go back and look at what their names meant. You know, what's your name? My name is, it's really getting rough out there. What's your name? My name is, if you can live to 30, you'll be lucky. <laughs> you know, that was what they were naming their kids. When you, when you look at the, the names that are listed uh, going up to the Genesis 6 thing. And Mary with the watchers do, and with all the technology and them ruling and, and their Nephilim children and everything else, Mary, they possessed no power to stop the judgment of God. Mm-hmm. No power. Well, and we can we can take the blood of Jesus and apply uh, it to the situation in Ukraine, Absolutely. because you know they they just came out. Mike and said that the Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich and the Ukrainian peace negotiators have apparently been victims of uh, poisoning. Poisoning, yeah. And so there's there's, there's a force, yeah, that is trying to stop peace that needs this war. Well, I think it came out of Biden's mouth that this war is going to lead to a new world order. And then, then he he made what they, they called a gaffe. I don't call it a gaffe. I think he knew what he was doing when he said that Putin had to be removed from power. And, I mean, these ever since this started, what he's, what's coming out of his mouth is rhetoric to spur a world war. He really is trying to get it going. Well, they, and so, they were, yeah, they were trying to do that during the Trump administration, and the whole time we're going to war with Russia. We're going to war with Russia. Let's have a war with Russia. And so, so you have to wonder why. What is what is the purpose behind this? And by us pleading the blood, praying for for every person you know that is has lost their home, lost loved ones, praying the right prayers, but but also applying the blood of Jesus where everything hidden. Yeah. will be pushed to the service that we'll really see. Very seldom do we really see what's going on. If oh, you just no, listen to the regular news. Um, it's a carnival show. Well, and I think that's why sometimes I had have problems with history is because it's been proven that what we were told, even in high school, is, is a lot of it's a bunch of bunk. <laughs> well, the, the, you know, there's an old saying that the, the, the winner writes the history. And but one of the things that you know, I bring this up in my in my first book, the Shiner Directive. There's only two forms of, of history: uh, accidental history. So it's just oh, it just kind of happened, and there was no. It just there it was, or there's conspiratorial history that there were agents in the background moving uh, to do something. 
Uh, you can see that with World War One. You can see that with World War Two. Uh, you you can see that in, in a lot of things. It, it, in fact, is basically if you've ever um, watched a show like with the drama of the kings and queens of Europe and all that. Uh, there's the Game of Thrones where one king is trying to you know is conspiring to overturn another, and there's whisper wars and there's economic wars and all these different things. That's conspiracy. And well, and it's always about money. Always about money. <laughs> And, and so when we look at this thing in, that's going on in Ukraine and Russia, we've got to look at who has the most to gain that's not even in the theater of war. Who's pulling the strings on the outside because the, the elite never get into the mud. They, they convince other people to do their bidding, little mm-hmm. pawns on a board to do something. There is an agenda here that they're not making public. And so there's, there's two things I want to do. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I plead the, the blood of Jesus over Ukraine and Russia. And Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over anyone involved, either publicly or privately, especially those that are way behind the scenes that are yes. the, the, the power players. Expose the wickedness. Father, I also plead the blood over all blood that has been shed. And I forbid the occult for being able to use that shed blood as a power source mm-hmm for what they're wanting to do in the earth. And Father, now I also plead the blood asking that everything hidden in this conflict would be revealed and that the news media and that the intelligence communities cannot hide the truth. But Father, let that which has been whispered and that which has been planned in secret be shouted from the housetops, we ask. And Father, most of all, bring peace to this conflict and resolution, we ask, in Jesus' name. Well, and we, um, we've got to keep our eyes focused on the kingdom and what God wants us to do. And it's easy to just think, okay, everything's falling apart. This is the end. You know, let's just dig a bunker. But there's there's a lot to be done yet, Mike. There is. Uh, we did get uh, the ceiling on part of our building over there. I think, uh, I think they were finishing it up last night. All, oh, all except for the lights. I think the electrician needs to come in and finish those up. I hadn't been over there, but it, Mike took a picture of uh, where they'd finished. Is it Was the kitchen done too or just outside the kitchen? Do you remember? I don't remember. He doesn't remember. He's too busy getting stuff done. Bless his heart. <laughs> but um, we're going to be having that up soon, and things are coming right along. Thank you guys for your support. We appreciate it more than we can ever say. Thank you for your prayers. Yeah. Met with the individual people for them to work up a plan to get all the stuff in that we need. And we're probably going to have to do it in a, in a couple of stages. Not, and one of the things we need to pray about is that they're having to adjust their prices on the equipment monthly. Mm-hmm. It's going and up it's that getting, And it's getting right. harder to get. And so, you know, she said, and she said, well, she says, I say that for this for all the churches. We'll be praying that it's available when we need to order it <laughs> instead of saying, well, I can get it in six to eight months. And so uh, we're, 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 our, our goal is to uh, have everything done and have the center open by next spring because I, I think it's going to take that long just simply because of delays. And I've been warned that, you know, when we get ready just to order the chairs, uh-huh. there, could be, there could be a six-month delay on the chairs. Uh-huh. Well, I'm, I'm going to keep praying for fall. But whatever God, I want, I want God's timing on it. Yeah. But I don't want the enemy delaying things either, and Me I'm neither. not going to allow that. So we, through prayer, can do that. But I'm looking so forward to having everybody over there because I think it's going to be uh, what it says in First John here. We're all going to be walking in the light. We're going to have fellowship one with another, and we're going to see the yeah. power of God move. Uh, and, I, I want to bring our partners in there and say, "Look what God did, yeah, and look, look what we did together." That's with God. right. That's right. And I'm working on, uh, you know, the what I need to do with the food. I've got a lot of that in my mind. I'm going to have some practice runs to make sure I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and and I've got some good good plans with some good food. And, um, I just think that's so important that we get to fellowship. And, and on top of that, um, I don't want anybody to have to pay for, um, you know, we're, we're not going to charge for the conference, and I don't want people to just be overrun with food prices. And so... That way we can have fellowship and people can not have that burden on them. They can just come in there and yeah. and worship God together. And She's we'll, been talking about actually building a permanent barbecue pit right outside the, the door of the kitchen. 
And either that or she has this griddle, Mary. I've learned about something that is called smashed burgers. And it's like how they do it to steak and shake. Oh, with that little but, iron on top of them? Well, they'll, they'll, they'll smash it flat, but before you... On the, you, you press onions in on the one side and you and you press the one side down without onions and then when you flip it over and press it down it's flat it caramelizes the onions oh, into that the sounds burger good. not everybody likes onions though you got to consider I, that with a big group <laughs> but, but uh, i could have caramelized onions on the side i thought i thought you know i'm, I'm gonna figure out uh, that uh, you know that'll that'll fit somebody's diet if they really look at it hard well, it fit my diet <laughs> <laughs> But we're looking forward to it, guys, and just just keep agreeing with us that that God's going to have us there on the time that we we are supposed to be, that every plot and scheme of the enemy falls to the ground. Yeah, and we're not having. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of uh, backlash on anything. Everything's going relatively smooth, so I think the prayers are are forming blockades to the yeah. enemy, and and we're just heading right on in there. And what they're what they're doing looks wonderful. I've got to say, so far, the educational wing looks great. This other one, then, uh, we'll have left the fellowship hall to do, but I think we can get that done pretty fast. Yeah, and uh, just just excited. And uh, I'm not waiting till the center opens before I start producing new materials. As soon as I get this new book out of the way for uh, Defender, I've got a lot of things God's been talking to me about to begin putting into place. Uh, and I'm also, we're, we're changing the way that we're doing Biblical Life TV and I'm going to do more of a studio set down kind of thing. But I'm also uh, thinking about even making my notes available. That way, and the notes will just simply be when I'm quoting somebody or quoting a scripture so that you guys can see the references mm -hmm. and, and look them up for yourself and understand where I'm getting a lot of these things from. And so when I, when I, when, when we get to the, this new format, you'll know it because I won't be behind a pulpit. I'll be sitting at a desk that, uh, jump over to the KIB site and there will, there will be a PDF for you to download of just the notes with just the uh, information and the resources that I pulled in to put that study together. And that way you can print it out, have it for your fellowship. I know that we, Mary, we have a lot of uh, home fellowships that use the uh, biblical life TV as the teaching and then they'll, uh, they'll take it apart. Uh, in fact, one group told me they, you know, well, I listen to you for an hour and then we, we break out the notebooks and, and Bibles and snacks, and mm -hmm. for the next five hours, we're going through it and looking up references and doing everything. This way, they'll be able to look up what I have looked up and uh, use that in their studies. Oh, and that's so going to work well. Excited about that, guys. We've got we've got a lot planned. God is good. Don't forget that. And He loves you so much. He loves you. And one of the things that we pray over all of our listeners is that uh, God would supernaturally protect and provide for you. And I believe that he's going to do that in a, in a supernatural way. And, Father, we just, we just thank you for those that have partnered with this ministry. Father, the faithful remnant that belong to you. Father, I ask that you would give them a fresh anointing. Father, that they would begin moving with supernatural insights from the Holy Spirit to apply to their lives to see supernatural turnarounds where the enemy is defeated and Jesus is glorified and that they're made whole. And, Father, I thank you. And I praise you for it, in Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual, you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the kingdom of God in the Bible, and who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. 
the reality of the Principality's wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.